Hook your ideal client and maximize your productivity with Stephen Richardson, episode 315. Are you ready to make your law firm a profit generating machine that will free up your time and skyrocket your impact? With more than two decades of business growth experience and having proven that you can be successful while prioritizing your family and your impact, introducing the Profit with Law podcast. I am your host, the creator of the firm differentiator 10x effect, Moshe Amsel. Well, hello and welcome to another amazing guest interview here on the Profit with Law podcast. I'm your host, Moshe Amsel, and today I have uh, Steve Richardson with me. Steve is the uh, founder of uh, Richardson Consulting Group, Richardson Consulting Group, but he also is the uh, the founder of the Richardson Law Firm, uh, an attorney having practiced for over 35 years and a solo attorney with his own successful professional business for over 20 years. Uh, Steve struggled to get everything done. He had to work in the business to generate the income while also working on the business in order to grow and thrive. And there just wasn't enough hours in a day. And if this sounds familiar to you, it's because it's pretty much what every solo attorney goes through when they're starting to grow their business, start trying to figure it out, navigate their, 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 uh, their trajectory. Um, unfortunately, a lot of them never figure it out. Uh, but through perseverance, uh, Steve implemented ruthless time management, well-structured procedure and systems for getting the work done on his cases and leveraged automated marketing targeted to his ideal clients to bring in more business without spending more time to do so. With a desire to spread the success, Steve turned to coaching and consulting with other true or supported solos to help them get to where he is and get off the hamster wheel of a busy and chaotic solo law practice and into the practice of their dreams. I'm excited to uh, jump into a conversation today with Steve, um, with, specifically on some of these some of these topics of, of things that he has implemented in the past. Uh, I'm sure that we're going to cover some ruthless time management. I'm also interested in the automated marketing targeted to his ideal clients. So uh, we're going to bring Steve on the show and uh, and get to know him a little bit and see if we can't um, pick out some ideas for you to take and put into practice in your own law firm. Um, and that's the most exciting part of having a guest on the show is being able to learn from others in their own experience. And Steve's got uh, 35 years of legal experience, but 20 years of experience running his own business and, and uh, definitely gonna, gonna find some golden nuggets there for you to chew on. Steve, welcome to the show. Oh, thanks for having me on, Elijah. It's my absolute pleasure. And, and really the thanks goes to you for giving us your precious time spend with our listeners. It's very kind of you. Um, and uh, we always appreciate it when, when you take the time to have a conversation with us. Um, so I want I jump into a conversation with something really easy, tee, tee it up for you. And that is just to let our listeners know a little bit about yourself, because I, I gave you a little intro that you prepared for us and, and you know, for me to just read. But the reality is, is that it doesn't give, you know, a real picture of who you are as a person, uh, maybe how you got into law or the specific area of law that you practice and, and how you, you know, how you developed into that. I'm guessing when you started your own practice 20 years ago, it looked very different than it looks today. So uh, give us a little bit of the backstory uh, behind uh, Steve Richardson. Well, uh, growing up, Moisha, I, 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 as you can see from my gray beard, I'm more of the of the the Perry Mason generation, uh, as opposed to the LA Law or the Law and Order generation that you see of, of people that see lawyers on television and and that may inspire them to go into the profession. And that was me. I've always been a, a bit of a ham. Did a lot of theater as a kid, and and so being wanting to be a trial lawyer and and become an attorney was was one of my dreams, and ultimately got into the law. Uh, and <clears throat> about uh, back in two. 1999, 2000, I had been working for other firms, uh, doing some trial work, some other stuff. And really, I got the, the, the as they call it, the, the entrepreneurial itch uh, that I wanted to go out on my own and, uh, um, and do things my way, It'd take the kind of cases I wanted, not what was assigned to me. Uh, and I found that, that being a solo just was maybe happier. 
you know, I had more control over my business. I uh, was fortunate enough that uh, to choose these practice areas like bankruptcy and, and traffic court and student loan work uh, that I enjoyed doing uh, and uh, gave me, allowed me to make money and have fun doing it. But like anything else, it's a struggle when you're doing it yourself. And, and there are a lot, these, a lot of solos these days are what we call true solos. It's just them or an assisted solo. They may have a, a virtual assistant or something like that. Uh, but it, it's, it's a struggle and it has changed when I first opened my practice. Uh, you know, it was just after the, the new phone books came out. So my timing wasn't that great. Uh, but I advertised in a local uh, paper called the uh, shopper's guide. And that got me some clients until I can get into the new phone book. And then I got a web page in 2008 and, uh, went from there. So, the marketing, the law, and the, the business of law has changed quite a bit in the last 22 years. Absolutely. And, you know, we, it's so easy to forget um, what we had before. And, mm-hmm. you know, and, and I tell so many of my clients, or I talk about it a lot, where, you know, it used to cost you a lot of money to start a law firm. I mean, you, you had no choice. You had to rent an office. Mm-hmm. And you had to put an ad in a phone book that was a static placement for a year. Mm-hmm. And, um, and it wasn't cheap, especially Mm-mm. if you wanted it to be noticeable, you needed to like do like a significant portion of the page or half a page and whether you want to color or not, um, mm-hmm. you know, and then those ran like, I, I think it was like 2,500 a month and 5,000 a month for the different, you know, size ad you were doing. Mm-hmm. Uh, and, and people now they, they're like, they, they want to start their law firm with a hundred bucks and, you know, on a laptop. And, and they balk at, at the idea of handing over 2,500 a month to a marketing agency that's going to give them reach that's far beyond whatever they would have got with a phone book. So um, just very interesting how um, the easier things get, the harder it is to get people to do what they need to do to actually make something happen. Mm-hmm. Uh, but you've been through the trenches, you've been through this all, and you, you had to figure it out, right? You didn't have the placement in the phone book, so you had to go and, and find business elsewhere and mm-hmm. I think that's really the key is, is, you know, you got to start bringing in clients from somewhere. Um, so you, you've got experience with that along the way. And uh, I mean, you were a little bit late to get a website back in 2008, but uh, you got one nonetheless, right? Well, uh, a website that really made me money. I mean, I had one from 2000 that I put together with uh, something some of your older listeners may sound familiar, uh, Microsoft front page. Mm -hmm. that allowed you to create websites and upload them. And and it was a website. I had a website, but it wasn't uh, as robust as it is now. Uh, And I had a a couple of bad months in 2008, and I realized I had to do something else. Uh, And and the the website was there, but it really wasn't a source of revenue. Mm -hmm. Uh, So I made a major change then. And then 2010, I went with a different vendor, made a change again. I've been with them since 2010. Uh, but yeah, you have to, you have to pivot. You have to find new ways to make money. Absolutely. Um, so it's interesting because, you know, it, it, you almost don't need a website to make money, but at the same time, if you have a website, you got to do it right. And you got to have, you know, it, it's gotta, it's gotta bring the traffic. Mm-hmm. Um, what, what do you think? Like, I guess there's different stages for a solo, but let's start with just somebody who's getting started. And I, I don't want to alienate a lot of our listeners. We, not, we're not necessarily a show that's specific to solos, um, but there's going to no. be a lot of things that we can pull out here. Mm-hmm. Let's start at the beginning. Let's start as somebody who's just starting their law firm. What do you think is like the number one thing they need to do from a marketing standpoint to start to bring in clients when they open their doors? Well, I, I think that uh, it, it depends some to some extent, how long they've been practicing at the time they say they open their firm. Uh, If they've been practicing a few years uh, with a firm, they may have developed some relationships with colleagues or other like professionals where they might have a good referral network. Right. Uh, If that's in place where you already have other attorneys referring you work or other, I'm a bankruptcy attorney. I, I work with accountants and accountants, you know, refer me work uh, right. depending upon your practice area. So it, if you've, if you've been in practice for a few years and you have those relationships, certainly work those. Uh, I think also that, and, and it's, 
it's it's a multi front war. You you've got your referral network. You have your electronic marketing through your website. Uh, you need to you know uh, get a, a domain registered and, and get a a good website up. Uh, and that's that's a whole thing with getting the right uh, website vendor and knowing how to use that website uh, to market your practice. But at the very least, if you get a good website up with a good design that works not only uh, on a computer screen, but more importantly, on a handheld device, at least 60% of all searches now, if not two thirds, are being done on mobile devices, on people's phones. My wife does most of her computing and whatever she does on her iPad mini. Right. She hardly uses her laptop. So having a, a mobile friendly website uh, that has good content, that has the answers to people's questions, because a lot of times uh, people are, they have, they're not ready to hire a lawyer yet, but they're, they're looking for information about the situation. And in that search, you want to be the one that they find and they, that they relate to. Now you've been at this for a while. You're talking about content. What mm -hmm. do you still create new content? And what is the what does that look like for you, as far as the length of the content, the cadence, how often you're doing it? What what, what do you, what's your content strategy right now? Well, you, you have to continue to feed the beast. I mean, you know, content is king, and you need to continue. Now I've been doing it for a long time. I've got hundreds and hundreds of, of pages on my website. Uh, I tend to write uh faqs uh mm -hmm. because and with a title that is a question because <clears throat> people and i do it too and i'm sure you do it when you're looking for something you ask a question, google, google a question yep and if you uh crack do your keyword research and and frame the question properly uh then you'll get in front of the person that's asking that question mm -hmm. so you you have to have a regular content strategy where you're regularly adding content uh and it, length, it depends on what you're writing you know, yeah. it, it, and how uh, in-depth it has to be. If it's a simple question, a simple FAQ that has a simple answer, it may not be as long as an involved article about you know, the, the, the top five defenses in a New Jersey DUI case you know, that's going to be more involved. Right. Uh, and you get into SEO as far as keywords, you get into really from a marketing standpoint, how you write it and, and, and writing that content to your ideal client, your proper audience. There's a whole bunch of stuff involved in doing it right. Yeah, I, I think that this is why a lot of law firm owners don't do it is mm -hmm. because they know that there's a lot involved and, and there's a lot that they need to know. And they don't want to put in the effort to something that's not going to produce the results, right? So if I know that I need to be good at SEO to win, but I don't know the first thing about SEO, I might have the greatest content in the world, but I'm never going to take pen to paper and put it down because what if I didn't do the SEO properly and it never ranks? I'm going to write an article nobody's ever going to see. Mm -hmm. So what what do you think somebody should do? Like if they they're, they buy into this idea, like I need to, and I know that you said that, you know, if you have a referral network, start there, but what if you don't like, what if you, you know, what if you, you're starting from scratch and you got to throw a website up, put content up and hope that it's going to start to rank for you. Um, what's, what's the strategy to get somebody to just start cranking content out? Well, that's part of the problem and, and why, you know, I talked about getting off the hamster wheel and then there's so much you can do uh, a couple solutions, uh, depending upon if you're just starting out and money's tight, then, uh, you may have to um, uh, either do it yourself or, or have their content writers out there that write specifically for lawyers. Uh, there's a site called Jarvis AI, which is a, an artificial intelligence site that you give it some information and it'll write the article for you. Uh, and you can just go through, edit it, clean it up, that sort of thing. If you don't have the time, uh, if you have more money, hire a, uh, um, either a full-time or part-time marketing person, maybe get a, uh, an intern, a college intern, somebody that is majoring in marketing in school, uh, someone to help you and take that burden off you and, and work up the content. So what you're doing is just going over it, making sure it's accurate from a legal standpoint, that sort of thing. And then, and having them put it up on the website. 
You know, we forget about college interns. That's a great idea to have, mm -hmm. you know, a college intern do that kind of work. And, um, and social media is another one. Like if mm -hmm. you want to have a social media presence, but you don't have the time for it, or you don't have the wherewithal for it, go get yourself a, you know, a college intern. They don't even have to be majoring in marketing. Mm -hmm. I mean, anybody who's half good at social media is going to be a perfect fit for that. Right. So, uh, well, you got to be careful with social media because social media is just that social. You know, mm -hmm. you, you, there has to be a certain genuineness to it. You're out the, it's you out there being social with other people, connecting with other people. Right. You know, you have to be careful. And if, if somebody else is doing it for you, it may sound, you know, dry and calculated and, and, uh, you know, intentional to get business as opposed to just being friendly, you know, talking at a cocktail party. Right. You know, that's what social media is. So that it's a kind of a fine line as far as delegating social media. You have to be careful. Yeah, absolutely. But you know what? There's, I mean, there's a whole business around it, right? There's social mm -hmm. media managers and uh, oh yeah, they charge, they charge a lot of money, probably just as much as your SEO folks. And, um, but they do, they, you know, they do their job, right? They do a good job at, at, at social media. So, um, but often uh, you need somebody to just handle the posting. You don't want to you know, have a software tool do it because then the algorithm dings you for that. So uh, it's good to have somebody who can just execute on whatever's being created. Mm -hmm. um, all right. So one of the things that, that we had in your bio, actually, I'm going to take a quick detour because we didn't mention in your bio anything. I don't think about you having written a book. So we didn't talk about the fact that you're an author, right? So <laughs> you, you wrote a book. It's, mm -hmm. for, it's for attorneys, right? What, what's the name of the book? Uh, it's called Getting Off the Hamster Wheel, uh, and the subtitle is uh, Transforming Your Law Practice to Make More Money in Less Time Through Effective Systems and Marketing. So I don't know whether you can see yeah. it there, um, but it, it, that's it's written. And now, a lot of these ideas can uh, uh, help non-solos. It can be a small firm uh, of attorneys. Uh, big law is a whole other, a whole other market, a whole other thing. But if you're solo or a member of a small firm, a lot of the issues and, and hurdles are the same and, and therefore the solutions uh, will resonate. Uh, but I wrote that book. I, and talking about attorney marketing, that, this is actually my second book. Mm -hmm. uh, my first book was, is called Hitting the Financial Reset Button, A Guide to Getting a Fresh Start in New Jersey Bankruptcy. Mm -hmm. And that sits on my desk. And that creates a, gr a great a uh, piece of authority for people to say, oh, look, you know, I'm going to hire this guy as opposed to some bankruptcy attorney down the street because this guy wrote a book about 160, 170 pages uh, on bankruptcy in New Jersey. So yeah. that can be a, a powerful lead magnet for people. Yeah, I've, um, uh, I heard somebody say um, uh, you don't need a business card if you wrote a book, right? It's a book is like the, the best business card out there. You just yes. hand it out and um, it speaks for itself. The fact that you're actually authored a book, it, it gives you, uh, it gives you uh, credibility, it gives you authority. Um, and it also provides material for your potential clients. So uh, definitely makes a lot of sense. And, um, and we've had, we've had a, a few podcast episodes specifically around book writing, uh, mm -hmm. for attorneys. And again, I mean, it, it, there's, there's a million and one ways to market your firm, mm -hmm. right? Uh, you got to choose the one that's right for you. You got to choose what, you know, what do you have the financial bandwidth for? What do you have the time bandwidth for? Um, what do you think based on your practice area, based on your clientele is going to resonate the most with your people is going to find the most people for you. Um, and you know, a lot of it has to do with how are they looking for you, right? Is somebody actively looking for you or are they, do they have a need? Like, for example, estate planning is a great idea, great example where mm -hmm. people are not looking to, to do estate planning. Mostly like the, you have a handful of people that would, you know, like a small percentage of the population that will proactively say, okay, I need to do an estate plan. I got to meet with an estate planning attorney. Those are usually the ones who have a lot of money and they're very smart about what they, what they're doing. Mm -hmm. But even a lot of people with a lot of money don't do that. Um, I have family members are directly like related to that. I know that they haven't done anything with, you know, preparing for, for, you know, for that eventuality. Estate planning attorneys now need to not only go out there and find those people, but they have to educate them on the on and and get them to the point where they feel like there's a need 
before mm -hmm. they can even have a conversation about whether you use my firm or not. Mm -hmm. Whereas somebody who's, uh, for example, in bankruptcy, um, somebody's going to get to a point where they just cannot handle that phone ringing anymore mm -hmm. uh, from creditors, and they're going to seek a solution. How do I? How do I resolve my? You know, deeply in debt, can't make my payments. How do I resolve it? Or how mm -hmm. do I go through bankruptcy? And when they start asking that question, you know, th then you have to capture them at that moment. Mm -hmm. Right. So um, it's important for law firm owners to know who their market is, to know who they're who they're marketing to and, and how they are seeking the services or not seeking the services so mm -hmm. that they choose the right marketing platform, the right option. Right. Um, so I love that you wrote a book. I think that that's awesome. I think it speaks very well to the specific clientele that you're doing. And also the other thing that you mentioned before, doing the FAQs on the website, mm -hmm. right? People are asking questions when they owe money. They're asking questions. Mm -hmm. How do I pay this off? How do I get rid of it? How do I, you know, how do I survive? Mm -hmm. And when you start asking those questions and showing up in Google search um, for them, uh, not only are you get they getting the answer, but you're now their voice of authority. They're going to dive into more material of yours and ultimately, hopefully, pick up the phone and have the phone ring. One of the things that you mentioned in your bio is that you automated some of your marketing strategies. So can you talk to us a little bit about more about that? Like what, what does somebody do to, to automate this to, cause I mean, at the end of the day, when it comes to growing your law firm, every attorney, the, their number one complaint, I don't have enough time. Yeah. yeah, I know. I know I need to write a blog. I don't have enough time. I know I need to write a book. I don't have enough time. I know I need to run some ads, but I don't have enough time. Mm -hmm. So what, what's the, you know, what, what's the solution? What, what's this automation that can help them get this done mm -hmm. with less time? Well, that, and that you're right. And, and that's why time management and, and work management, task management is the first chapter of my book. You can say, you, you know, you can read the sections in any order you want, but you're not going to be able to implement this stuff until you get a good handle on your time. Mm -hmm. So you're right. That is, and that's, again, another reason for the title. But to your question as far as automation, uh, it goes beyond just having a website. Because I, one of the, uh, there are a couple of big mistakes people make in their marketing, marketing with uh, websites. One, uh, or any kind of advertising. Uh, one, they don't tell what the person what to do next. You know, they, they provide the answer to the question. Uh, as, but if that's all they do, if all they do is answer their question, they'll bounce away. They'll keep on going. There has to be a call to action. There has to be something that says, okay, if, if you're uh, deeply in debt, if you live in this geographic area, you realize you've got to file bankruptcy and, you know, call this number, click on this link to schedule an appointment, get, download this book, give them something to do. OK, give them a way to raise their hand. All right. And ask for more. Get them uh, give them a way to self-identify. And when that happens, now you have their contact information. Now you can advert you can market to them. Mm -hmm. uh, it's uh, and do direct response, direct response, information based marketing. And, you know, the 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 ethics rules vary from state to state. But in New Jersey, if that person contacts you and gives you permission to reach out to them, then you can ethically advertise, provide them all sorts of information. So what has to be behind that website that provides the content, that provides the call to action is a, uh, a contact relationship management system, a CRM, all right? There are a lot of them out there. There's, there's Keep, uh, which uh, it was rebranded from Infusionsoft. Yeah. There's uh, uh, MailChimp and Active Campaign and, and all sorts of systems uh, that allow you to automate uh, a, uh, a marketing system. So, for example, somebody. I want to. I'm going to uh, hold yeah. that thought for one second. I just want to mention one of our uh, past sponsors of the Law Firm Growth Summit, uh, Lawmatics. Uh, mm -hmm. Lawmatics is also a CRM built specifically for law firms. So, right. uh, if you're sitting here thinking, okay, I'm going to implement the CRM system. Uh, you can go look into the options that, that Steve just shared, um, but definitely include Lawmatics in your search. 
they'll be happy to get on and show you a demo, uh, mm -hmm. work with you to help you implement that with your practice management software um, and create all kinds of amazing sy systems and automations for, for your law firm. Go ahead, Steve, continue with your thought. So you, you get them to raise their hand, to fill out this information, and then you can automate a whole email campaign with them. You know, it, it's already set up. You've written the emails. You got the system there. It'll go out this day, the next day, the day after that, whatever it is. So that as people, you know, you're, you're marketing as you sleep, people are coming in, visiting the site, raising their hands, filling out the form, and they start getting emails. They start getting information marketing to them. And whether that's, uh, and, and there's all sorts of little lead magnets you can use. We talked about writing a book. Well, yeah, uh, but a book doesn't have to be, uh, 150, 200 pages. And you say I don't have time to read a book, write a book. Your book can be 20 or 30 pages. A lot of the books on my website are, are less than 40 pages on a particular topic. It can be a five or six page report uh, with some charts or information. It can be links to videos. It can be anything. It's something is va of value that somebody wants in exchange for giving you their contact information so you can market to them. And then you create these campaigns. I have a standard campaign, uh, no matter, there, there are campaigns that are designed uh, for a client, depending upon what, uh, what they download, what the lead magnet is, that is, that is um, uh, focused towards what their interest is. Is it bankruptcy? Is it student loans? Is it a, a traffic ticket? Whatever it is. But also I have a campaign that sends out an email every 10 days for six months. And that, that gets them engaged. And then I look to see, are they engaging? Are they doing things? So you have this regular contact with the person. And sometimes, depending upon when they reach out, they may not be ready to hire a lawyer when they first reach out and self-identify, uh, especially with bankruptcy. It's something they don't want to do. So they sit around and they procrastinate. They kick around this, that, and the other. But if you're not in regular contact with them, sending out emails, uh, an email newsletter, something like that, mm -hmm. they're going to forget whose book they downloaded from where when it's time to buy. And maybe they go somewhere else. Yeah, it's very true. Very true. Um, definitely got to, got to keep front and center. Uh, a lot of, uh, a lot of people wonder like, what is the value of this regular newsletter? Because, you know, I get newsletters from other people. I don't really open them. So, mm -hmm. you know, why should I keep sending them, uh, to, you know, to my list or my, the people who have, you know, expressed interest with me? Mm -hmm. Um, do you have any, any metrics on that? Do you have any, any data on the value of sending a regular newsletter and, um, whether, whether it actually works, brings business? Well, that's, that's the other point you raise. It, it, uh, the mistake that people make is they don't track their marketing. They don't see how it's working. Uh, my CRM, and I'm sure the, the Lawmatics and, and other uh, CRM systems will tell you what your open rate is. Now, open rate with things that Apple's doing and everything else, privacy uh, can be less um, accurate. Uh, it's usually an understatement of what your open rate is, mm -hmm. but you look through and you see, okay, uh, what are they opening it? It, it? Look at what your subject lines are with an email newsletter. We get a ton of the email every day, but you, you got to give them an intriguing subject line that gets them to open it. Your email should uh, provide useful and interesting information to people. Um, a lot of it, not about the law, Mine has oftentimes recipes in it or, or different, you know, tips and tricks and, and um, life hacks and things like that. But you're also promoting content on your website and you're, you're providing links in your email to drive them back to your website for more. And, and a CRM should tell you what your click through rate is for that particular email. And you can track and see how am I doing? What do I need to change? Test different types of of subject lines or headlines or content or format and see what works. Yeah. Um, and, and you bring up a really good point because um, everything that we do in our business is an experiment. Mm -hmm. Nobody knows what works until you've tried it and it works. And we, we often tend to assume whether something's going to work or not. And we make decisions about whether to pursue it or not based on that assumption. Mm -hmm. A lot of that assumption might be based in fear. Um, but the reality is, is that you don't know if something works or not until you tried it. And you can, you can, we can take a sample set of 10 law firms and each one of them will have done something different 
and they each will have a different experience with it. So mm -hmm. you might have five that say, yeah, newsletters suck. I've tried it. I spent a lot of time on it and it showed, you know, it bore no fruit. And then you have somebody else. You know, I recently sat in a, a whole full day seminar with Craig Goldenfarb, um, who's got a a, a a a a very successful personal injury firm in the Florida area, and they do a monthly newsletter, and they print it and they send it out, right? Mm -hmm. So they yeah they do the email mm -hmm. newsletter too, but they they physically print it and they make it really col you know colorful, thick paper. It looks like a magazine. They show mm -hmm. us a copy of it, um, and they send it out to their clients. Why? Um, because it's going to end up in their bathroom because they're going to read it when it looks interesting. It looks intriguing. And ultimately it moves the needle for them in their business. It mm -hmm. you know, gets, gets them business. And, um, you know, so you take somebody like that, who's running a, you know, a multi-million dollar practice and, and, you know, compared to somebody else who says, yeah, they don't work. Who's right. They're both right. Well, the question I have is if somebody says it doesn't work, my first question is why? Do you know why it didn't work? Right. Maybe you did something, maybe you just need a better subject line. Maybe you need right. to do this. Find out why it didn't work and then try something different. Now, ultimately, it may not work for you. Uh, but to say, oh, I tried that, it didn't work. Well, why didn't it work? And, and just a tip for your listeners, too, and what I do in tracking everything is uh, I'm sure a lot of your listeners are people use uh, QuickBooks as I do. And there's an ability I can assign. I said, all right, this income coming in, what's it, where did it come from? Did it come from my website? Did it, was it a referral by another attorney? You know, uh, was it this particular um, lead magnet? Mm -hmm. So I said, all right, well, that this is where this is the amount of income that's come in from this campaign. And, and on the other half of the P and L, this is how much it cost. So you look and you track and you see how, what's my return on investment? What's my profit margin? Is it working or isn't it? And I got out of the phone book way before the phone book died because I tracked it. Mm -hmm. the, the folks from the, the phone book came in and they wanted me to renew my contract. I said, no. And it was just in the fall when it came out. I said, why? I said, because you haven't got, gotten me one single client since the beginning of the year. <laughs> right. So, so but I knew that I didn't keep 10 months. Yeah. I didn't continue to throw money at it. It right. wasn't working anymore. It just dropped off a cliff and I knew that and I spent my money somewhere else. Yeah, and that's very wise of you. Um, you know, it encapsulated in, in your most recent discussion is the assumption that people are using QuickBooks to track the money in their business. And, uh, you know, so many, so many firm owners do an awful job with bookkeeping. Mm -hmm. um, you know, it, it, to them, it's a once a year experience for tax mm -hmm. time. And uh, they're not monitoring those numbers regularly. And, uh, you know, that it, it really speaks to the fact that you need to you need to know these things. You need to know it as you progress throughout the year. You need to be mm -hmm. able to make decisions based on facts, based on what's actually happening, not based on your assumptions, your feelings of what might be going on. Right. Um, one of the things that you I want to switch gears here. One of the things that you mentioned is ruthless time management mm -hmm. talk talk to me about that how does how does somebody conquer their time how do they get a hold of it, it it's almost like um i mean we're, and basically what we're doing is we're having these conversations about the finite pieces right the money right. And the time the and so we know we only have so much time in the day mm -hmm. so many firm owners just feel that, that, that like they're you know they're, they're jumping from here to there and they're really not getting traction with anything mm -hmm. they're not getting anything done um and it all boils down to just really having good habits around mm -hmm. around your managing your time so what what what's the solution for them what do you do with with your clients what do you share in your book uh what did you do to to win at time management well, I think the biggest problem that people have with time is that they cede control of it to others. Uh, in the book, I talk about uh, the time bandits. That was an old Terry Gilliam movie many years ago, but uh, I use that to describe the different types of people that will steal your time and you're letting them do it. Uh, and you need to be ruthless about not letting them do it. Uh, one of them is just controlling the phone. You know, the phone rings and there's a call coming in and, and the attorney thinks I've got it. I've got to answer it. If it's a potential client, uh, I've got to answer it or that guy will call somebody else. But when they call, 
they then suck your attention away from what you were working on uh, to shift gears, talk to them, um, whether they're, it's a productive call or not, a new client call, whatever it is, but it, it interrupts your flow. It interrupts your ability to get work done because you allowed that interruption. Uh, there are uh, some successful attorneys that I know, they do not take or make any unscheduled phone calls. You cannot call their office and, and ask to speak with them. You'll, they, you can schedule an appointment to talk to them, uh, but it, you just can't speak to them and they'll schedule a call with someone else. Uh, I've been, and it's tough to do because you, the, the, you don't want to get the client upset with you or you don't want to miss that opportunity. Uh, but I have a, I use um, the Microsoft 365 platform and there's a, a system called bookings within it. There are other platforms like Calendly and Fantastic Cal and, and different scheduling apps that you can use, but people can click a link and schedule a phone call with me. And I encourage them to do that rather than just picking up the phone. So that's one area uh, to work on to sort of uh, get back your time and also make appointments with yourself. Uh, your assistant or your scheduling app may make a appointment for you for a phone call or with a client, but you need to be able to block out your time on your calendar. You know what you got to get done this week. Well, block out time on your calendar. The Thursday from 10 to 12, I'm going to work on this. And people know not to schedule client meetings or calls at that time. And you regain control of your time. And that is just critical. Yeah, I, I, I agree with you a thousand percent that what's calendared, what's scheduled happens. Mm -hmm. um, and things don't compete with your schedule. Mm -hmm. So like, if, I mean, we're on this podcast interview, right? This was scheduled through Acuity. It was, you know, I do my recordings on Tuesdays. That's when the block is open. You right. had to pick a Tuesday mm -hmm. from, you know, and, and it's not every Tuesday, right? We do one, one Tuesday a month when we're short, we do two Tuesdays a month. Um, but that's basically it. I, this way, I know that not only is it scheduled and is it, you know, I'm, I'm going to stick to it and, and I, nothing's going to come in the way of that. But also, I am sticking to one topic or one thing that I'm doing at a time. Like today, Tuesday, I'm doing podcast episode recording. I'm not worrying about handling any of my client work. I'm not worried about making sales. I'm not worried about managing my staff. I came to mm -hmm. work today with one thing, and that is I'm getting behind a microphone and I'm having conversations all day. And mm -hmm. this way, I'm in a mode and I can be... I can be effective in that mode without the distractions of going to other things. Um, one of the things that um, that happens, and, and it, uh, there's a term for it, it's called context switching. Um, mm -hmm. I don't know if you're familiar with it. I first heard about it from, now I'm forgetting his name. There was a guy who uh, had a program. I haven't seen it run. I haven't seen it promoted to me in a while, but he was running a program. Um, he worked with uh, professional athletes. Mm -hmm. Um, and one of the things that, that he, um, helped them master is this, this idea of, of maximizing your time, but basically he had this whole scientific study that was done based on context switching. And what context switching is, is when you're, when you're switching from one mode to another. So for example, if you're drafting a, a legal document and your phone rings, right mm -hmm. now you think, oh, it's no big deal. I'll answer the phone. It'll be a two minute conversation. I'll hang up, continue what I'm doing. But the reality is, is from the moment that the phone rang, you now had to switch the context of how, what your mind was doing, leave what you were doing, go answer the phone. When you come back, you actually need to get back to the mode that you're in. So you have to remember what you were up to. You got to kind of review in your mind, everything that's happened until then to continue drafting where you were. So the reality is, is you're losing a lot more than just the phone, the phone conversation itself, but you're losing the time leading up to when you answer the phone and the time after to get back to mm -hmm. what you were doing. And it's that context switching that really eats up a lot of time. Mm -hmm. um, so if you can start batching your time in, in modes, like, okay, I'm going to do my drafting on Tuesdays and Thursdays in the afternoon, and I'm going to do my, uh, all of my, you know, all of my uh, consults for new clients are going to mm -hmm. happen on Monday mornings and Wednesday mornings. And you start to create these pockets of time where that type of thing is happening Mm -hmm. That creates an efficiency that 
um, goes even beyond scheduling it. Um, but I love this idea of calendaring things. I think it's awesome and amazing. And I actually do it myself. I have my team put on my calendar. You got to record some solo episodes. It's going to go in this, you know, in this time slot, you got to work on this client's, you know, ta tax strategy. It's going to go in this time slot. Um, mm -hmm. And they book that on my calendar so that I know I, you know, I, I sit down at my desk and I know what I should be doing right then and there. Well, one of the other, uh, another big time bandit is email. I mean, it's, it's a scourge and, and uh, the, the worst thing you can do is to check your email the first thing in the morning when you come into the office. I check my email twice a day, right after lunch and at the end of the day. Uh, and so when I come in in the morning, I don't look at email. I, I just put my head down and start working and blow through stuff in the morning. Uh, and then after lunch, I'll, I'll look at emails and follow the two minute rule. If this is something I can take care of in, in two minutes or less, I'll do it immediately. If it's something a little bit more involved, I'll create a task and I'll put it on my calendar to get it done at some future time, depending upon how urgent it is. Uh, and you also have to go with your own energy levels. Uh, I'm much more focused and aware in the morning. In the afternoon, after lunch, I slow down, you know, and so I've, I get my big tasks done in the morning and tend to schedule appointments in the afternoon because I can, in talking to people, I can be engaged and, and that suits my energy levels at that time. A and you do the right task at the right time based on your own energy levels. And that can really um, free up time for you because, and turn off notifications. They, your computer shouldn't ding every time you get an email. Because that's going to, you know, tempt you to look at it and see what it says, uh, yeah. but just ignore it, except when you're supposed to look at it. I love, I love that you're bringing up email because um, this is, it's one of those things that, you know, people get very defensive about. Mm -hmm. um, and there's two arguments that they're going to, that they're going to make when we bring this up. One is it doesn't really take that much time. You're wrong. Right. Mm -hmm. And the second is. Well, if I don't respond to my email immediately, I'm going to lose clients, I'm going to lose opportunities, things like that. And I want to address those two because uh, to just take it on face value of you sharing it is great, but the reality is that some people need some convincing. Mm -hmm. And uh, folks who are listening, um, Steve is spot on to bring this up, uh, but I want to dive into this just a, a little bit further because I want to convince you that there is a better way. Um, number one, if you simply just take out a sheet of paper, put it on your desk, leave it there for seven day, five days, a full work week. And every time that you go into your email to check it or to do something in your email, you put a little tick mark. Mm -hmm. Okay. And, um, we're going to go on an assumption that you spend 60 seconds doing that mm -hmm. when you check your email probably is more, but let's just use one minute, right? At the end of the week, count up how those tick marks and multiply it times one minute, right? Right. So it's the number of tick marks is how many minutes and see how many minutes you spent on email throughout the mm -hmm. week. Now, the typical average person checks their email somewhere between 40 and 50 times a day. So that means that you are spending practically an hour if we assume a minute, which in a minute is very short, it's actually more than that, but let's just assume a minute, you're gonna end up realizing at the end of the week that I spent an hour a day, five hours a week or four hours a week checking email. Mm -hmm. That's a lot of time. Mm -hmm. You wanna put numbers to it, look at your billable hour fee, you know, $300 an hour, $400 an hour, whatever it is, multiply it times your four or five hours checking email, and you can put a dollar amount to how much it costs you to check your email, right? Mm -hmm. Um, so the first thing is, is you have to believe that, it, that it's a problem and you have to prove it to yourself. So track it, mm -hmm. you see what you're doing. The Absolutely. second, yeah. The second thing is, is, as, and I saw, I, um, there's a tool you can use and there's also a tactic you can use to get over this problem of, well, um, what if. I'm going to lose business from it, or people are going to get pissed off about the fact that they sent me an email. I didn't respond. So I saw, um, I first experienced this from Tyson Mutrix. I don't know if you ever heard of him. Yeah. Uh, Max a, law. Mm -hmm. yep, mm -hmm, maximum lawyer. Um, so him and, 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 uh, Jim hacking, Jim. Mm 
mm-hmm. founded an uh, 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 organization called Maximum Lawyer. It's a very well-known, mm-hmm. well-known Facebook group. Uh, a lot of attorneys in there. Probably most of my listeners know, know of Max Law. I'm on anyway, the group. <laughs> yeah. So Tyson, um, I had him on the podcast early on when we first initiated the podcast. And the first time I sent him an email, I got an order response from him. And mm-hmm. the order response said, hey, uh, I got your email. Uh, I only check my email twice a day at this time and this time. And um, I will read your email during my next block of time. And I will reply to it at that time. Don't mm-hmm. expect a response before then. Right. So it was very well worded. It was very nice. And it let me know what to expect. And immediately, like any expectation, any reason why you might lose a client or you might piss off a client or you might lose an opportunity is simply because there's an a expectation there until you set a different one right? that you're going to respond immediately. And the moment you set the expectation that you're not going to respond immediately, it switches, it changes, right? They, as long as they were communicated with and they don't, ha- they don't expect to hear from you until time X, perfect. Now, this goes, you have, to this goes back to Steve's original strategy, right? You have to have that time to check your email and respond to those emails calendared in every day. That's right. So that you're you're staying true to your word. Because when you set an expectation that at two o'clock I'm checking my email and I'm going to re- reply to you, that person knows between two and three to expect a response from you. Five mm-hmm. o'clock comes, they haven't heard from you, you're a liar. Yeah. Yeah. Right. So it can backfire if you don't stick to it. But if not, you can know going into it that I've got this autoresponder, it's working in the background. Every email provider gives me the capability to have an automatic response and I can word it nicely and I can set that expectation. And now I know that I don't have to check my email except during those pre-specified, predetermined times. The other thing that you can use is a tool called SaneBox. Have you heard of SaneBox? Yes. Mm Mm-hmm. So SaneBox is awesome because SaneBox will filter your emails and grab the important ones and put them where you need them and you can train it. So basically like you can have a client folder Mm -hmm. and then every client email comes in you move one email to that client folder and it'll automatically set up a rule to move those emails to that client folder. So it train, it learns as you, as you move stuff around, it learns where you want it Mm -hmm. and it trains these rules automatically. So you don't have to sit there creating filing rules. But what it does is for me, it compacted the amount of time that I need. Like, let's say I have an hour block to go through email. Mm -hmm. It would take me 30 minutes to work through all the email that came in, but without even, without even responding to any of them, just to go through and see what came in and decide what was important, what wasn't important Mm -hmm. with same box. It took five minutes. Mm -hmm. Because it completely eliminated the newsletters and the marketing emails and the things that they're not junk. I want them. I want Mm -hmm. to look at them, but I can look at them once a week and be no worse for the weary, Mm -hmm. but I can, I can not miss a client email. I cannot miss a vendor email. I cannot miss an email from a staff member that is important for me to see. And um, implementing a tool like that can really help you be much more effective during the time that you're processing your email. So Mm -hmm. Steve, love the, this um, concept of, of, tackling email first because that's a huge time suck i think you're absolutely spot on and i was and getting back to your auto response point uh i received i had emailed uh an attorney friend of mine actually an old college buddy who is an estate planning attorney in phoenixville pennsylvania and a very well-known and respected uh, business consultant guy named dave freeze and i emailed him and i got an auto response back uh that kind of what said what you said in essence, but also offered other options. You know, if you need this, send an email or call so-and-so. If you give the the sender alternative ways to get the information or 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 to fulfill that need, maybe somebody else on your team can take care of it for you. So not waiting for your email can get taken care of or put a link in there to schedule a call uh, so that they are able to take action and feel that they've gotten through to you or gotten the answer that they need. And that, so that auto response email is a great tool. Yeah. I love that. I love giving people other options of where to send their, Mm -hmm. their, their, their request, especially if that's what you're going to do when you open the email, right? You're going to look at it and you'll be like, Oh, this is not for me. I'm going to either forward it to a team member or I'm going to reply to this person and tell them to go to a team member. Um, 
I'm a big fan of Michael Hyatt's. I don't know if you're, you're familiar with him. Michael Hyatt wrote um, many books, uh, does a lot of time management work. He also, um, they created the Free to Focus Journal. Uh, mm -hmm. Freedom, uh, what's it called? Um, I think it's Free to Focus Planner is the name of the planner. Um, mm -hmm. But essentially, uh, he, he, wrote, he wrote a book together with Daniel Harkavy called Living Forward, which I give to every one of my coaching clients when they join my coaching program. Mm -hmm. uh, it's all about creating a life plan. Um, mm -hmm. But he also does a lot of talking on time management. He's got a podcast and, he, and he's got, he's got a, a, some, some books on the subject. And um, where was I going with bringing him up? Um, now that I gave him his intro, uh, I don't remember. It'll come back to me. It'll come back to me. <laughs> the name's familiar. We were talking I, about something else. That. It'll come back to me. So uh, we'll get back to what I wanted to share that Michael Hyatt does or shares that um, that I thought was important for our listeners. But um, we're we're heading. You know, time flies when you're having fun, and we're heading into the the end of the the uh, uh, the podcast scheduled uh, time time slot for us. So. Before I give you an opportunity to, to share with our audience how they can follow up with you, um, I, wanna, I wanna just share an opportunity that you've provided us to get, get your book into, uh, your physical book into some, some, some hands of our listeners. Uh, so folks, you know that I, we, you know, we thrive on ratings and reviews of the show. Um, what I want you to do is I want you to go into your, your Apple podcast player. And if you don't have an iPhone, you know, go to, go to Apple's website, you know, go to their, their podcast library, um, create a username and password for yourself, leave a review specifically regarding this episode, you know, mention this episode in the review and take a screenshot of that review and send it to info at dreambuilderfinancial.com. And my team will send the first five people that leave a review, send us an email. And by the way, people aren't, fallen over themselves to leave reviews. So don't worry about hitting the number five. Um, just do it. Send us an email and, and uh, you're likely to, to, to be one of the five. Because um, you know, people are like, oh, five people already did this. I, I'm not going to do it. Um, don't worry about it. We'll, we'll figure it out. We get six. We'll you know, probably splurge and get in, you know, buy a sixth book. But Steve's providing us five copies of his book uh, what is it? Get off the hamster, hamster getting wheel. off the hamster wheel, mm -hmm. getting off the hamster wheel. Uh, we'll get that book into your hands uh, physically. So we'll, you'll give us your shipping address and we'll send that to you um, absolutely free for leaving a rating and review for the show. So we'd love to have your feedback there. Even if you didn't like it, you hated the show. You want to leave a one star review and tell us how awful we are. That's awesome. <laughs> Just leave us a review and we'll send you a book. Um, so I wanted, wanted to get that out there because I forgot to mention it earlier. Um, and uh, now I want to ask you, Steve, when I close out the show, I always ask my, you know, my guests, if you had to leave one parting piece of advice for our listeners, one, you know, one nugget of wisdom, uh, what would that be? And then follow that up with how they can follow up with you. Uh, what's the next step you want them to take? What's your call to action for them if they really resonated with you today? Well, just they they need to uh, get better control of their time and get better control of their practices and and get out of their own way uh i think that once you um start you don't have to do it all you can delegate a lot of your stuff and that frees up more time to think more strategically about your business uh, and and think more towards growth and better marketing and, and all the things we've been talking about here uh, and to your listeners also, if you, uh, if you just want, anybody can get a, a, an electronic copy of the book, just send to an email to steve at stephenjrichardson.com. Uh, and I will send you a PDF copy of the book to read. Uh, there's all sorts of other information uh, on uh, my website, stephenjrichardson.com, uh, blogs, uh, other information on and, and tips and tricks and links to my videos and and everything else as far as content's concerned that's awesome thank you so much that's uh very kind of you to give a free book to, to our listeners so folks if you want to get your hands on the book uh getting off the hamster wheel if you want to get off the hamster wheel you want the book 
um, then definitely send Steve an email. We'll share that email address in the show notes page. So you can go to profitwithlaw.com to access that or right in the description of the episode, uh, depending on your podcast player should be there. You should be able to simply click through and uh, send him an email right on your device that you're using uh, and, and request that book. Don't forget, you can get the book physically in your hands. Uh, you can buy it, but you can also get it for free uh, by leaving a rating and review. Be one of the first five to do that. Send us an email and, um, and we'll get that book into your hands. Um, I do remember what I wanted to talk about for Michael Hyatt. So I'm going to share that now real quick before we sign <laughs> off. And that is, um, so Michael wrote a book on how to use an executive assistant. And yes. um, one of the, the main topics, like one of the biggest things that he uses an executive assistant to is to delegate email mm -hmm. completely to the assistant. Um, and he does, he describes how to do that. He goes through this whole process of basically just every time that the assistant doesn't know how to, re how to respond, you create a process for them. Mm -hmm. And most of the emails that you get can actually be responded to by just following a, a formula, following a template, following, you know, like what would you, and one of these, one of the, what triggered the, uh, me thinking about that was you, your example of this attorney who has all these alternate options on there because your assistant can know these are the alternate options. These are the things that you would respond to this person. Mm -hmm. And he encourages you in that book, not to have your assistant make believe they are you, but mm -hmm. they sh every re email response they send, they should say, hi, this is Bob, Steve's assistant, and I'm responding on his behalf. Mm -hmm. Here's the response. And it, this way they know they didn't get you. They got your, your executive assistant, but they got the response they needed. Yeah. Um, and uh, it's just a beautiful way of, of you know, one of the, the best ways that you can use an executive assistant and start to get those tasks that you shouldn't be doing. Mm -hmm. shouldn't you shouldn't be an email period mm -hmm. like even if even if you need to respond it should be your assistant reaches out and says hey you know bob asked this question and you just hit record on your slack channel or whatever method you have and you simply record a response back saying hey can you tell him xyz i need this document i need that document and blah 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 and you're done you don't need to sit there formulating the email, making sure your punctuation's in place and your spell check's done and sending it out. You can respond to that in like five seconds with a recorded response or a minute or two mm -hmm. instead of five or 10 minutes to send a written response. So get really good at delegating that to somebody else um, and get that off your plate. All right, Steve, it's been an absolute pleasure having you here. It's been a great conversation. I really appreciate it. Folks, if this is your first time listening to this podcast episode, this this was a great episode, right? So we have a ton more like that. We're well over 300 episodes here on the podcast. Go into the archives, listen to some really good ones. Um, we just have a, a, a bunch of amazing people who have been here. There's also a ton of content that I've done myself um, that it, maybe it's not as amazing, but hey, you know, it, it's, it's worth listening to. I, I took the time to record it and it's gonna add value uh, to your law firm journey. Uh, so if you like this episode, make sure to hit the follow button, hit the subscribe button so that you can uh, get notified every time we release a new episode. We're doing that every week, uh, usually twice a week. Um, and uh, we're getting, we're getting a, a ton of great content into your hands. We have people like Steve coming here uh, and just sharing with you their own experience, you know, 20 years of experience bottled up into an hour uh, for you to just say, okay, this is the key thing I need to hone in on. I need to go and win at. Um, mm -hmm. And today it was, hey, conquer your calendar, conquer your email, uh, and just get really good at being efficient and effective. And that's going to really move the needle for you. Um, mm -hmm. And then put some automation into your marketing, get some content strategy out there, uh, you know, get some pieces going that are going to be, you know, paying dividends, you know, day after day, month after month, year after year uh, for the growth of your law firm. Uh, and then, Last, last but not least, if you've already been a subscriber to this episode, to this podcast, you've been here, you've been listening, you're consuming the content, you love it, and you're always listening to it, you can do two things for us to really help us out. One, you can share it with a friend. So there's somebody out there who you're a colleague of, they're running their own law firm, they need, they need this content too, and they have no idea about this podcast. Reach out to them today, tell them, hey, listen, 
I've got this show I listened to. It's really good. Check out this episode. You know, Steve nailed it here. I really learned a lot from it. Um, share the episode with them. The second thing is, is ratings and reviews. I know that we did a promotion. Get, you, can, you can get Steve's book, Getting Off the Hamster Wheel, even if you don't want the book. People come to the podcast directory, they look at it, they're like, should I listen to this show? And they look at the ratings and reviews. We need quantity and quality there. So go leave us a rating and review. We just need more. And uh, we'd love to have your vote of confidence for other people to look at and say, okay, we're going to go listen to this episode. That's it, folks. Have a wonderful day. Enjoy your weekend. Uh, we'll catch you next week. Keep your law firms profitable. Uh, just keep executing on the strategies you, you listen to here. And you absolutely can and should be winning at the law firm game. Take care. Have you been enjoying the show? We sure hope so. To make sure you never miss an episode, be sure to hit the subscribe button in your podcast player app. Next week, we will be back with more valuable resources and ideas on how to break the mold and take your law firm to the next level.